Faced with the highest rate of homelessness in the nation, Hawaii needs new bold ideas to solve the state's homeless crisis. One breakthrough vision was inspired by a specific lifestyle with deep roots in Hawaii's history, and one business leader's personal memories of growing up during that era. But it would take a public-private partnership unlike any other in the country to make Kahuiki Village a reality. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Situated between on 11.3 acres between Sand Island and Keehi Lagoon Park is one of Oahu's newly formed communities. Kahawiki Village is the realized vision of businessman Duane Carisu to provide permanent housing for homeless working families in a plantation style inspired community setting. A unique state city and private business partnership resulted in the first phase of the village completed in just six Six months. In January of this year, 30 families moved into renovated, prefabricated homes that once housed the victims of Japan's 2011 tsunami. Is Kahauiki Village a model solution to our homeless crisis? Can it be expanded to other communities to help address our housing needs? Joining us tonight in the studio is the local businessman whose vision was to develop the village, a single mother who is one of the first village residents, and representatives from the social services community who managed manage and provide assistance to Kahauiki Village residents. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest. Duane Carisu is a local businessman whose vision was to create a community where Oahu's homeless families with children would find safety and stability. He is the project organizer for Kahauiki Village. Cambria Vance is a single mother and one of the first residents of Kahawiki Village. She's also the treasurer of the village Hui. Connie Mitchell is the executive director of the Institute for Human Services, which co-manages Kahawiki Village and coordinates social services for the residents. And Ryan Kusumoto is the president and CEO of PACT, or Parents and Children Together, which provides childcare services to the residents of the village. Welcome all of you tonight. It's wonderful to have something positive to say about our homeless crisis here in Hawaii. And Duane, I want to start with you. <clears throat> Tell us about the vision. What is a plantation village for folks who might not be familiar with that? And what inspired you to start this? Well, there's two questions. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, I expect two <laughs> answers then. <laughs> well, um, the, the project was started because something had to be done. So instead of um, we just talking about it, a bunch of us said, let's do something about it. Um, we, we thought we knew, we knew what we were doing, but it took people like these social service experts to tell us that really we, what we really need is long-term permanent housing in Hawaii. So that's what we did. Now, um, to answer your second question or first question, <laughs> uh, my father, I remember my father telling me that you put into life what you get out of life, what you put into it. And for us guys who grew up in the plantation towns, we, I think we got a whole lot more. Um, it was a special place and it was a special time where, where things like values and responsibility and character was more important than how much money you made. And so this sense of community is what we felt would be the foundation for many things, including um, the foundation for building what we feel is a, pl a, a village for people who uh, needed shelter. And, and so we built really an ecosystem to support this. So it's not only housing, but um, a child care center, preschool, a police rest station, management office, laundry facility, and and really um, having these social service experts help to support this feeling of community and to help build that culture, which we feel is actually 
more important than anything else. Wonderful. Yeah. Cambria, I want to ask you about your experience living there, but before we get to that, we have a piece of tape that we want to roll, which shows the moment that you saw the space that you and your son would be living in. Let's take a look. It's a, it's a real home. <laughs> it's ours, baby. Oh, I love it. My name's Cambria. And this is Kainoa, and we just appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys, thank you. What a beautiful moment. It's hard not to get emotional. <laughs> I'm getting emotional myself, um, and I can see you are too. Tell us about that moment and uh, what led you to be there that day. Um, I just, I was so blessed to have the opportunity to be one of the first 30 to move in. I was living in transitional home after being in a shelter. So I had been in shelter transitional home for about almost two years and um, just finally getting a place of our own, me and my son, um, we had never had that and it was overwhelming. Now you've been there for a few months now, how has it been? Uh, amazing, every day we get to go home to our home and um, have a place of our own, a community of our own, um, you know, friends, family as neighbors. It's great. Connie, I think what's different about this and one thing that we want to explain to the audience is that this is not a transitional space. Tell us about how this is unique in the spectrum of IHS services. Well, at, <coughs> excuse me, at, at IHS, you know, we have uh, a lot of different services and the places we have for people to live are shelters. You know, so it's a very time limited kind of experience and um, the goal is always to be moving them into permanent housing. So when Duane decided to build Kahawiki Village, you know, and one of the first conversations we had was, we don't want people to feel that pressure you know, of having to leave after a certain time. And people always ask me, well, how long can they stay? And I always tell them, forever if they want to, <laughs> because it's permanent housing. And that's the really neat thing about it because um, when people moved in, you know, it, it just absolutely reduced the number of people that were homeless right then and there, you know, because it's permanent housing. And tell us about IHS's role in, in this village, because we know this is such a complicated public-private right. partnership, but um, you guys are right there on site, there are right. social workers on site, so tell us a little bit about that. So IHS was um, tapped to help find the families, you know, that would be coming in to uh, Kahawiki Village. And um, we decided to um, together to have some criteria about who would be living there. And the whole point was we wanted to have families that were really um, struggling, but they were really trying hard you know, to make it. And so uh, we uh, called out to our colleagues you know, in the other shelters and let them know that we're looking for families that are very motivated, who really want to advance their lives. You know, so um, we're going to provide the support, but maybe right now they really can't do everything that they want to, but with uh, a little bit of coaching and support, they'd be able to be sustainable in the future. And so it was really important to us that people were working that people, you know, had that experience of earning their income and it wasn't just, you know, um, welfare benefits or you know, anything like that. So I think it was really important, you know, for us to find those families that were most motivated. Um, <coughs> Ryan, can, can, can I add please oh, jump I, on I, in. I think you're being too nice. You, <laughs> you guys actually were from the beginning help shape um, the, actually the look and feel of what Kawaiiki Village is today, because w w without your input, I mean, we we listen. I hope <laughs> you did. <we> <laughs> and, sure and and whatever you guys say, we we, we um, we're not experts, and so, you, you, um, but thank you. Thanks, Nate. No, no, thank you. It was really fun working with Wayne because you know his whole team was just awesome. You know, they really um, wanted to. Um, wanted it to be a success and they really trusted us and that was really really um, such a blessing to me you know to have someone say okay you know we trust that what you're saying is what we really need and you know um, the first thing was we found Ryan <laughs> you know, to help with the child care you know because one of the first decisions was you know if we want people to work we're gonna have people taking care of the kids right you know so Ryan ended up you know um, 
really graciously kind of joining the team, so to speak. Well, Ryan, tell us about your role. I mean, what does make this so unique is that it is families, and I know for so many families in Hawaii who are working, childcare is a huge struggle. Tell us how PACT is involved. So we're providing the um, early childhood uh, daycare um, for the residents of Kahawiki Village. And I think there was a recognition early on that um, yes, we need child care for the families that live there and have it convenient for them while they go to work or school. Um, and there's also recognition that access to early childhood is, um, you know, it, there's not a lot of early childhood facilities out there to meet the needs that exist. And so having something on site made it convenient for the families. And, um, you know, is a recognition also that um, for, for our children, um, the earlier you can intervene and provide those positive experiences, the better. Um, you know, early, early education has such a tremendous impact on a child's life and it's like we're sort of setting the roots for the future. Um, and those little experiences, whether interaction with another child, um, you know, to uh, interaction uh, with their parents or, and, or other providers, really helps to build um, a foundation for that child for, for years and years to come. And so we're very fortunate to be a partner here um, and provide those services r right on the campus for the families. Well, I'm sure that's making such a difference. Yeah. One of the things that also makes this project so unique is how quickly it came together. We have some video here of the moment the governor, the mayor, and Dwayne Carisu were there signing um, some very important documents. Tell us about that day, Dwayne, and how you were able to get this done in six months. Because I think in Hawaii, anybody who's even just renovated a bathroom <laughs> knows that it takes longer than that to get the permit. So how were you able to pull this off? Well, it wasn't only me. It, it was a group of people. And, <clears throat> um, and we all shared responsibilities and we all relied upon each other for our expertise. And somehow, even if we went our, our own ways, like, like Connie, we relied upon her for her, so, her social, server ex, ex, so, social service expertise. We relied on somebody like Russell Yamamoto for his expertise in, in, in the civil work and Randy Hiraki for plumbing. So we all did our own thing. We, we all collectively um, worked as a team. It's the same way with members of uh, the mayor's executive staff. We met every other week, and they actually helped guide us through problems that they they foresaw, and as we and problems that we had along the way, we resolved together. So, it I, I think if we didn't go through that process, we'd still be in our planning stage today. And for people who don't know the background of how this all came about, this is state land leased, I understand, for a dollar a year to your foundation to make all of this possible. And there's some emergency proclamations as well. I mean, just so that people understand sort of, because when they look at this, they're going to say, how were you able to do that in such short order? Okay, so the governor issued an emergency proclamation. It was primarily made for government entities. So, But we fortunately qualified for it at the tail end. So what this proclamation allows you to do is to find homeless solution and bypass most of the permitting process. So this state land was put under the jurisdiction of the city, and the city is the one that actually leased the, the land to us for a dollar a year. The significance of it is the city is the one that administers all these permits. So by working with them day to day, made, made things a whole lot easier and quicker to get done. Um, Connie, let's talk about what it takes to be able to live there. I would imagine that given how large our homeless crisis is in Hawaii, there are a lot of families who would love to have a home there. Um, so let's look at some of the requirements, and I believe we have a slide to talk about selection criteria. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to actually be able to live there. Well, one of the first criteria is that you have to be a state of Hawaii resident. Because <clears throat> we do have a lot of people that um, you know would come, and we were afraid that if people got wind of it, that people would want to come here and you know actually apply to Kahawiki Village. So um, you have to be a state of Hawaii resident. You um, are living in a homeless shelter, and you need to be earning income, 
and um, at least one of the adults, you know, if it's an intact family, have to be working. And there needed to be children, you know, the school-age children. And we were giving priority to young children so that the um, preschool child care center would be full, you know, so we would really be able to run it and have a good core of people there. So really, you know, um, uh, we wanted people that could afford the very, very affordable rent because it isn't as high as market rent. And you know, we needed people that were really committed to what I would consider economic advancement. You know, people want to get ahead. You know, um, and the rent right now for a one bedroom is seven hundred twenty-five dollars a month. For a two bedroom, it's nine hundred dollars a month. Does that include utilities? And yes, that's it all does. inclusive. Yes. Uh -huh. So obviously, that's well below market rent. But that still is a, a financial commitment. Yes. And so um, one of the first things we did was you know to uh, orient folks to the need to set up a direct deposit account, you know, so that we worked with um, Central Pacific Bank to just provide that um, money management part, you know, and really let them know that rent is important to pay, you know, that it is something that needs to be prioritized. So it um, gets deducted every month, you know, at the beginning of the month, and so you better have enough money in there to make that right. happen. You know, Cambria, um, oh. Actually, you know, I remember we going through the creation of the Lease, applic rent lease application, mm -hmm. and and then like all these pages that everybody had to fill out, and I, I told Connie, why don't you just make a one-page thing and just put it, put an X and <laughs> just let them go. But you, say, you said no. <laughs> everybody needs to go to the process, like right. right. They're renting, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we're really so, about... So the thing is, we're, we're learning from you <laughs> as we're going through this whole process. But really, yeah. it's about um, gaining tenancy skills, you know, really helping people to um, prioritize the right things, you know, so that they really do take care of the place, you know, and have pride in it. Because mm -hmm. it is theirs, you know, to live in and, you know, to really make their home. And that was really important to me, that everybody had a chance to really make it their own. You know, we gave them the basics at the beginning, but you know, you could really decorate it the way that you wanted to, and you know, just make it your own. Tell us about that. This whole idea of living in this plantation village is the community aspect that Dwayne talked about. Um, we mentioned at the top of the show that you're the village hui treasurer. What is the um, what is that community? How is that growing, and, and what is it like to be a part of it? Um, it's awesome to be a part of it, and it is growing and will continue to grow. Um, uh, we have the core HUI members that um, are there for concerns of any other residents to um, can bring it to us and then um, we can sit and talk about it and bring it to then IHS or whoever needs to be addressed if anyone. Um, it's, it's awesome to watch this community just form and come together and you know the plants go in and the grass turn green and and the you know the garden's starting to get planted and and, and you guys help to do it too yeah that's right yeah it's, it's mm -hmm. incredible yeah oh yeah. Yeah. yeah of course so it's really owning where you are yeah I, I saw you out there with <laughs> with my son <laughs> with your son <laughs> yeah yeah I, I did you know it's it's hard with a 15 month old son to uh, do as much I would have done much more gardening but he you know I do what he lets me do and <laughs> and. Uh, there's usually other people there to help keep an eye on him as well. So, and it's not just landscaping. I mean, you're going to actually grow food and, and yeah. you know, fruits and vegetables. Yeah, the um, Future Farmers of Hawaii are going to, um, which is a group of kids that are Future Farmers of Hawaii, and they're going to help teach us about you know growing all different kinds of food, and so we can grow food to you know actually eat. And actually, the um, the trees that are part of the landscaping among the um, the units are all fruit trees. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah is so awesome. you're getting double use, right? Shade mm -hmm. and fruit, yeah. which is the whole and, point. <laughs> and somebody's and they're building a farmers market. Yeah, right? that's amazing. Yeah. And then I also heard they're going to do um, aquaponics. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's just it's really really going to be. Amazing. And actually, I I saw the advisor for the future farmers working on this rack and I said and he had bikes I said what 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 did you, what did you find these bikes he said well I found we found them on the street and they've repaired the bikes they're actually doing a they're going to do a bike sharing thing mm -hmm. for Kau Iki Village. That's cool. I mean, cool. Is that cool? So what's neat about this is that you have your basic ideas and yeah. then you have all of these sort of things that are added on. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we have some folks writing in, and we want to invite, of course, you to come join us on this uh, on this discussion tonight. Um, Greg from Kalihi wants to know, how much will this village cost the taxpayers? So uh, one thing that's very important is that you had a lot of private industry donating services, um, building materials, actual labor. Um, but what is the uh, state or local or federal commitment in terms of, you know, those dollars coming so, in? So um, of the 12 and a half to actually 13 million dollars uh, for a total budget, four million, four million dollars came from the city to pay for the infrastructure, bringing sewer and water from Sand Island to the property. The rest of the money is all private money. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ryan, tell us about the families who are in the child care program. They do have to pay a little bit. Yeah, so the majority of the costs are being paid um, by federal funds as well as some private donations um, uh, through the AIO Foundation. Uh, but the families will pay um, a, a small portion, about $100 a month, for the child care. Um, the child care is for 10 hours a day and it's the entire year. Uh, so it, even during summer breaks and winter breaks, we're going to um, be operating because we know not, you know. Well, jobs don't take summer breaks off, so you know, and the, the kids need a place to go. So um, we are going to be operating um, for 10-hour days um, throughout the year. Tell us about the kind of community you're trying to foster among those children. Yeah, it's really, you know, it's really sort of cool because um, th this is a cool sort of project for us. Um, we have a lot of preschools in, in various areas, um, but anytime you can build a preschool within a, like a community and a village, you know, it's, it's that sort of village mentality. You, you, you live together, you eat together, you grow together, you learn together. Um, it really sort of builds um, upon the foundation for which uh, Kahawiki started. And you know, they're talking about all the different things that are happening there. We talked about this earlier, that the idea wasn't just to build a shelter. It wasn't just, like, I'm going to build a house and so people can live in that. It was about building a community. And when you build a community, you have to include everyone at the table. Um, you know, the voices of the residents, the voices of the, out, you know, the outside community, the, re the, the businesses, and the children too, because they're such a vital part of it. And, and they're going to be a, a, a big part of how that place continues to grow over the future. And so we're, you know, part of, I think, what our curriculum will be, will be, you know, sort of understanding um, their, their environment and how they can be, continue to be um, lifelong learners, but also contributors for the com community as well. Wonderful. Yeah. I know this is phase one and we have some statistics to show you tonight about where this is and where it's going. So if we could get those slides up, let's talk about that. It's phase one and as we said earlier tonight, there are 30 families who are now living there. 12 one bedroom units, 18 two bedroom units. Phases two through six are under construction. At this moment, there are 115 residents, 30 females, 21 adult males. 14 children in daycare, ages six weeks to three years, 12 children in preschool, along with two Micronesian families. As we mentioned, this is phase one, and we're going all the way up to phase six. So, Dwayne, tell us about the timeline for that and where this eventually is going. How many families or how many people overall do you envision living on this parcel? One day we envision, this is Connie's statistics, 629 <laughs> adults and children, something at like least, that. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Or, about half of the homeless families currently in transition homes on this island. Wow, I mean, what an impact. Yeah. Um, how, I know you're building and, you know, if you drive by there, um, you know, as you pass by on Nimitz, you can see that there's still a lot of construction going on. Uh, how soon do you expect the phases two to six to be completed? We expect to start some things um, later on this year, but full-blown construction we expect beginning of 2019 and we'll finish um, by summer 2019. Wow, that, that is relatively soon considering how many houses you're talking about building. Yeah. Um, Connie, tell us about the wait list. Who's trying to get in there and, and how can people, if they are interested in becoming a part of this community, how can they do that? Well, we have about 43 families that are already signed up you know, um, on the waiting list. And um, I don't know if my staff have already vetted them, but you know, if people are in shelters, you know, now or a li little later, even, you know, they'll have an opportunity to apply. You know, so all the um, shelters actually have the application. So you know, um, I think if they fit that description that I mentioned before, then they certainly are welcome to apply. 
Uh, we have questions from the audience pouring in tonight. So this is for Dwayne. Have you been asked to do consulting on neighbor islands, specifically mm -hmm. Hawaii Island? I would imagine that you've been asked to do consulting around the world <laughs> on something like this. But um, can this be replicated in other communities in Hawaii on Oahu and beyond? Um, yes, it can. We, we've, uh, the mayor of, Mayor Kim um, has approached me and he's appointed Lance Niimi to look at what we've done and to work on replicating it on the big island. I think they've found certain pieces of properties that um, I think are ideal to replicate Kauiki Village. But the, the, the template can be replicated any place else in the world. Um, so it's, um, it's a it's public-private partnership. Um, it's about the city or the county putting in infrastructure and but like Ryan said first it's about starting with from community you know Connie Dwayne is very humble but can something like this be replicated without a Dwayne Creasu behind yeah. driving the bus <laughs> <laughs> well we're gonna have to find more people like him you know because there was so much passion behind his vision and I think that that has really been the inspiration for all of us that's been working on the project and he likes to remind me that he's not a developer you know, right. he's a I'm, I'm you know? a developer. but you know he sure has done a wonderful job developing this project maybe that's why people helped they felt sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, this boy. I mean here we're seeing some video of even the National Guard coming in mm -hmm. and actually doing the concrete pour so you have so many different layers of people helping and another thing that I think is really important and unique is the job opportunities that if you work there you will be able to find employment pretty close by tell us about that so early on we had a commitment from Vicky Cayetano um, that she would hire in and all adults that that lived in Kahauiki village and she said in the past she tried um, hiring and she said even the best of them would last two months because of child care and transportation. She said, well, Kao Iki is perfect. So today, she, she's, I just saw her last week. She said she hired four adults from Kao Iki Village. Wonderful. And, and we have other employment opportunities within walking distance. Uh, we have a, Waihata has created a training program for those in Kao Iki Village that would like to get into the food and beverage business. And I think um, Palama Market, who's opening a convenience store on site, um, said, but they're not going to start work until they find employment, um, people from the village to work in that store. And I think they have some applicants. Good. Yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I know a few people that from mm -hmm. the ideal, community right? that have, just yeah, walk, right? Just walk, right? yeah, lots of people have applied from everyone wants that job yeah <laughs> perfect I mean, tell us what that means in the community not just that um, folks have the opportunity to work but to know that all of your neighbors are contributing in that way oh uh, it's it feels like they really care you know and that they want to help and that the businesses around there are you know they a lot of them have reached out to us uh, to the community and uh, want to employ us and help us with our future not just having a job but something we can grow in um, you know Dwayne brought up a, a really impressive statistic if you think about it. he said half of the families that are homeless can eventually be housed in this project alone um, people are asking what about housing for the unemployable those with mental illness um, is there a is there a kahawiki for folks like that absolutely um, and <clears throat> As, as I was saying earlier, we've, we've all, all of us who volunteered on this day to day, we, we all say we've learned a lot from um, working on this project. And one of the things that we've learned from IHS is that no matter what the root cause for homelessness, we all need to start from community. You need community first. So the, the, temp, the template for building um, villages for um, people with different root causes for homelessness um, is the same, but maybe the housing units would be different. And um, for those involving uh, who, are, who have mental illness or, or have drug, drug issues or even the youth, they, they would need more dollars allocated for social services. But other than that, I, I think 
we working on a project feel deep in our hearts that we know it can be done. I think we also um, want to see some diversity after a while because, you know, when we live in any community, you know, um, it's not all families that are our neighbors. You know, sometimes there's kupuna, you know, and there's other people that are just couples. You know, so there's, there's really an opportunity to create um, a reflection of our community, you know, in any one of these villages, you know, that, are, that is there. So if someone does suffer from mental illness when they're stabilized, you know, they could just blend right in actually into a community like that. So I think it's really about finding solutions for people's needs, tailoring the housing, you know, as um, Duane mentioned, but tailoring the, the, um, the package of services that people get too. Oh, I learned something new. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, right. Um, well, and what about folks who do have substance abuse issues? I mean, would you envision something with a drug treatment center on site? I mean, how, we're talking about, you know, a lot of investment, financial investment. I think at, at one point when we were talking about, you know, um, like how large the village is, and I think they thought about, you know, maybe one section, you know, being for maybe transition age youth or something like that, you know. So I think it's really, um, we're kind of growing and learning as we go, but I do think that um, having the, um, the treatment services very readily available, or at least you know, being able to just jump on a bus and go down you know, to where the community center is where you would be getting some of the services is important. You know, but I think when you come home and you're in a village, you know, I, I really hope that people feel like you know, they're building that neighborhood. You know, and so, you know, um, we don't all have services in our, our own neighborhood, right? We go and we take the bus or we drive over to where it's at. So I'm hoping that we can, you know, do the same thing there. Can I just say, I know that um, some of the people at Kauhiki Village went to Women's Way or went to Hina Malka, um, did the treatment, had, uh, had, you know, time clean, then we were in transitional housing and then got into Kauhiki Village. So it, was like a two-year process, but then at the end of the two years, we're blessed with the Kahawiki village. So, um, to touch on mm -hmm. right. the, 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 the treatment. Right, and, and I would bet that some folks, you know, are still maybe um, attending meetings. And oh, absolutely. Going oh, yeah. To yeah. Support groups. You know, oh, yeah. They're not there, and, you know, they go to where they're happening in the community. Yeah. Um, Ryan, folks want to know which kids these kids, which schools these kids will eventually go to. Is the Department of Education prepared for the increase when you are talking about ramping up by, you know, several hundred kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, these kids from the elementary age will be going to Pu'uhale, um, which is sort of right down the road, and then they'll be going to Kalakaua for intermediate, and then Farrington. So they'll be in that sort of Farrington complex, um, which is something that Connie guys actually helped to um, work on because uh, we wanted the kids to be able to go to school that was in close proximity to Kahawiki. So, um, and, and they are ready. I mean, you know, the, this is a, a, an increase. Um, the initial increase won't be as significant. Um, we have about, I would say about 20 or so of those zero to five year olds, so they're not quite there yet. Um, and then about like 10 to 15, um, uh, you know, in, in elementary age kids and older that um, are gonna be in the schools now. Um, so they, they will be ready. You know, and I know that. that the city put a bus stop right out front. Is that the same yeah. bus that the kids will be using, uh, the same stop that the kids yes, will be using? Yes, that's correct. So that, and that's another very uh, convenient thing for, for the residents of Kahawiki to have transportation um, easily accessible. There. Okay. In the morning, it's really cute that you see there's a volunteer mom that walks a whole bunch of kids to Pool Holly School <laughs> and back. Yeah. I, I don't know how, how that system works, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, wonderful to yeah. see. I mean, Ryan, talk about the difference. I know that, you know, so many families in Hawaii who are struggling with this, their kids are going to school. Um, the difference that this makes for these children who get to live there and to have that stability of a home. Oh, yeah. You know, um, you know when you think about um, learning and education, um, you know, th that's it's super critical. But if you have a child who's got an environment that is... Um, sort of filled with like what we call stress. I mean, they're worried every night about where they're going to sleep, what they're going to eat, um, those, those kinds of things. You know, education sort of is like the last, not the last priority, but it's a lower priority because those other basic needs need to be taken care of. Having a, 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 a safe home, um, a secure home, 
and a welcoming home, it, is, it makes all the difference in the world and helps provide that foundation for, for that lifelong learning. I mean, you, you eliminate some of those barriers, um, you really make it a lot more easy to have that educational experience and so it's, it's so critical and then to have it on site makes it that much easier and you know I think for a parent you know if you're at work and if you're in a two-parent household you, you don't have to worry as much because maybe one parent can just you know go home, home earlier pick up the child um, or knowing that you might have someone else in the village that could maybe pick up your child for you because you know that community I mean, there's a lot of benefits of having it right there on site. I mean, one of the things about um, being, you know, ha having house insecurity is that there is um, so much stress associated with that. Tell us just as a mom what a difference it's made for you as a parent to be able to parent your son since you moved in and had that stability. Uh, it's, me it's meant the world and not only for, you know, just the stability, but like being able to like, you know, then once you have the security of a home, you can then because uh, now that I'm a mom, you know, my friends and activities have changed completely. You know, I'm not at the beach surfing every day. I, you know, so now I can actually like, you know, do mommy and me classes and, you know, know a, I, we have a schedule, we have a, a set routine and plan and know that, oh my gosh, in six months I have to move somewhere else so I don't have that worry anymore so I can actually, you know, have a life and start to make friends and it's, it's just means the world, yeah, it's great. Um, Billy from Kalihi is asking Connie, if there are um, empty shelter beds at any given time, why is the state investing uh, money, land, and resources into those, in, into that kind of a model? Into this model, Kahuiki Village? Right. Well, I think that it's different, you know, I mean, people who go into shelters, they need to move on, you know, because they're there very temporary. You know, we're shooting for 60 to 90 days, you know, at the most in an in emergency okay. shelter. So we really need more housing. No one can deny that we are just having a major shortage of affordable housing. And that is a lot of the cause of homelessness. You know, at the end of the day, no matter, you know, what has contributed to someone's uh, homelessness, the only thing that's going to end it is having a home. You know, so it's really important that we think about this permanent housing as the answer. You know, we certainly need all the other type of services, but we've got to have places for people to go. How is the, is there enough community support for something like this? I know that this particular site, you don't have a lot of neighbors per se. Um, you have a lot of industry around. Uh, do you see this being able to be replicated in more of a neighborhood setting? Yeah, and uh, you know, to answer the first part of the question about um, is there support, you know, when I think when Dwayne started this project, he couldn't believe how many people wanted to help. And you know, we ended up talking about, okay, well, this person wants to bring in this activity, you know, um, art activity and karate, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that, because somebody is bringing that in soon. You know, everybody wants to contribute, but you know, um, we had to kind of find a way to uh, also figure out how these fit in with the families that were there. So the first thing I told him was, wait, let's ask the families, what do they want yeah. there? You know, because it's really important, you know, to offer the things that they're most interested in and to match their passions with the resources that we're able to provide. So AIO Foundation, you know, Dwayne's Foundation, um, set up a volunteer management process, you know, so people who want to help can call AIO Foundation and then they are able to kind of um, talk to, you know, f through us, you know, the families and to figure out, you know, whether it fits with the village or not. Did, did people sign up for a karate dojo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people are, are very interested in it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Dwayne, I know you yes. said that there's a, it, it's been a learning curve for you yes. on this. Um, what has been the biggest challenge about this project? We talked a lot about the successes and all the folks who want to help and how you were able to cut through the red tape, but what's been the hardest part? Well, people that know me know that I'm not the smartest guy. No. So um, I, I, uh, I, I think it's, it's about um, the most difficult thing was actually <laughs> overcoming that, but um, you know how I can des I, I've described it recently. I'm not a woman, of course, but and I don't know what it's like to give childbirth to give birth to a child. But you know, I I think I feel the same way. It's been I know it's been really painful, but I kind of forgot. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, and, and a lot of folks say that the reason that Mother Nature does that to you is so that you have more children. Do you yeah. see yourself doing that? <laughs> 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 hey, somebody put you up to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but I mean, I think everybody wants to know, is there, is there another Kahawiki village in the works um, for another island or for another community here on Oahu? Um, yes, there are plans to build other ones, but we're hoping that some young developers will come forth and say you want oh, to pass the yeah, torch no, we'll do it and we'll be happy to help <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um connie what's the difference between this type of housing a caller wants to know and low-income housing oh you know we um when we started thinking about kawaii village and how we wanted to design it i think that inherently in the design is a desire to promote um, economic mobility you know so that um, we fixed the um, the rent at this rate because we said you know um, when you go into something like public housing as you earn more money you pay more you know and you might pay less you know at this point you know at the beginning but you end up paying more you know because it's a percentage of your income what we wanted to do was to set um, a rent that was um, affordable but not necessarily real comfortable until you know people could earn more but if they earned more they could just keep whatever extra they were earning for their family so it really is um, rewarding people who want to work and really advance their lives you know so it really gives them you know an edge to be able to do that um, tell us about your long-term goals where do you see yourself with this opportunity now going for you and your son um, well, honestly, part of me kind of wants to go back to school to be able to have a better career. And I feel like with a part-time job and a part-time school, uh, going to school part-time, I could still survive and be able to do this. So it's good, because living anywhere else, there's no way I could afford to go to school. So it gives me hope for the future. And I mean, I would one day love to be able to make enough money to move out and pass it along to the next um, deserving family. Um, it, but it, it, it's uh, reassuring and comforting knowing that there's no time cap. Like, you know, you have to, I have to have four years to go to school, get a better career, and then got to move out. Like, you know, when my son gets a little older, I can go to school and be able to make more money and survive on my own. And I really see that happening for you, Camria, because you know, you have the desire, you know, you you know that there are opportunities that you can take advantage of. And that's the whole point of, you know, what we wanted to design at Kahawiki Village. I mean I think about, you know, um, Dwayne's family and my family, you know, when um, I'm a daughter of immigrant parents and, you know, um, when my parents got here, you know, they basically got into, you know, a business, you know, uh, and all of the kids, you know, we, um, three of us went to college. One of us became a carpenter, but I'm a nurse and my sister's a teacher and my brother's an architect. But, you know, it's like they were able to do it you know, from the beginning. And just like Dwayne's found, look at who he is today. You know? <laughs> so, um, so really, you know, I think what we want to do is give people hope and that really the homelessness will stop here and there'll be no more homelessness in the next generation for that family. It really is an opportunity to just say, let's end it right here. Yeah, I mean, that must be so encouraging to know that you're giving your son this foundation. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Um, caller from Maui, of course. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of these. Dwayne, we really need you to replicate this project statewide. <laughs> 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 Mahalo to all of those on the panel. Great discussion. And um, there's some interest in the in the housing itself. Now, we, to we told you at the top of the show that these are prefabricated uh, homes that were used after the uh, tsunami in Japan in 2011. So um, they're just asking for a little bit more background about these homes. Dwayne, how did they come about? Where did you get them? And how did you work out that partnership? <laughs> kind of dozing off. A bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm an old man. You know? <laughs> but tell us about where where this all comes from. Uh, uh, so it's it's almost like things came full circle. Weeks after the tsunami hit on uh, uh, March 2011, we we did a fundraiser um, and for the community, and we raised a bunch of money for Tokyo, I mean Tohoku University Hospital. And in, the, in that process, we, we saw these homes and we visited some of these homes. And 
kind of forgot about it until um, Nate and Izumi Kinney um, reintroduced us to these homes and said, well, would you like to buy these for this project? And um, it, it was actually perfect. We, 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 the, the skin, the basic structure of the building it, it are those homes, but we, but we de decided to not take the roof that comes with it and not take the foundation. But instead we went to um, using all local material and union labor to build the structures and the roof and the foundation. So you, you basically have a new home with reused skin. So I remember when we did the pilot buildings at at um, the navigation oh, yeah. center in San Island. So guys, you know, Les Masutani and the guys from Coastal were taking off, taking out these things from the container, and, they, and we all said, "Hey, this stuff is new, but it's just that these guys they cleaned everything. Mm. <laughs> everything came out like it looked like brand new, brand new, and it was, they were all tested for radiation before they came here to make sure that everything was safe." Mm -hmm. Um, how is it living in one of those? What is the, the home experience like? Um, it feels like a home to me. Uh, it, it's nice. It keeps it cool inside, the um, material that it is. But you know, you know that inside there's insulation. Oh, there is? Yeah. So, <laughs> so these homes were built to withstand the extreme cold and the really hot summers. So. Yeah, because it, it doesn't get as hot inside yeah. as, as I would think because I keep my windows closed in the day when I'm gone. And when I come inside, it's not as hot as I would have imagined. Um, the other thing that's really neat is that there's so much energy efficiency on site. So I know you have those big Tesla batteries and you have all those solar panels. So it's sort of a self-contained system. Yeah, in Synergy Engineering, who did all the work pro bono, um, together with Photon Works, um, early on said, you know, because you're including electricity in the rent, we need to control the cost of power now and in the future. So can we um, try to design a system that's entirely off the grid? And they accomplished that. And in that process, they got Tesla to provide the, the batteries, um, the, the story. And Tesla told all of us that we are the first community in the world to be off the grid. It's, it's powering the grinder pumps, the street lights, all the commercial buildings and the homes. Wonderful. So that initial investment then saves costs down the line. Yes. Um, Cambria, uh, uh, Leanne from Central Oahu wants to know if you could talk about the kind of rules that you have to follow in the village. What are some of the standards that you need to live by to be a resident? Um, it's pretty much the same as any rental agreement you would sign to live anywhere. There's, you know, uh, no drugs, uh, n no violence, no um, loud after certain hours, you know, um, the kids are supposed to be inside when the sun goes down, however that doesn't always happen, <laughs> which is fine because I don't mind hearing the kids running around yeah. being kids. It's, uh, but it is, it's just like if you were to rent an apartment at any apartment place, that it's a standard lease agreement. And, and it must be comforting to know that you are among all of these families, so everyone sort of has yeah. a similar intention, right? Creating a nice environment. Absolutely, and, and everyone who lives there has worked really hard to get there. Uh, spent, you know, months to years getting, getting, trying to get further in life and get a better life for them and their family. And um, I know everyone's very, very grateful. I think there was a, a really neat scene, you know, as, as I was driving in um, to the management center, you know, I go there quite frequently, but during the spring break, all the, all the kids were home and you could see all the, them biking around and, you know, it, it just felt so wonderful, you know, to just see the village, a real live village like that with so many children. Um, and to participate in the child care, I'd imagine that the parents also need to be involved to an extent, parent-teacher meetings and all of that. Tell us a little bit about the parental involvement on that side. So one thing about our program is it involves a lot of parent interaction. So if I can just go through quickly the day, I mean, when, when the child gets dropped off, the child um, 
and the, well, the parent, the child, and the teacher are going to be talking to each other about um, the child that day, going through a health check, making sure that the child is healthy and able to, to be in school, and then talk about the goals for that day. And, um, and then throughout the, the course of time, um, there's, there's goals that are to be met. And, and we sit down with the parents and go through those goals. And then we track them along the way. Like, are, is the child at this certain developmental goal that the parent and us came, came together on and wanted to, to, to focus on? Um, like the number of words that they've learned or being able to hold a pencil by a certain time. We, we, we go through all those things and we, um, we get the parents to, to be involved in that process. And then talk to them about what are the things that they can be doing you know, outside the school too, um, after the school is closed. What can be, do be done at home? Um, what are some of the other interactions that they can be participate in? And, and it's, it, the more the parents are involved, um, on a regular basis, really the better. The parents are the first teachers, and so we, we do as much as we can to encourage that. Um, Kurt from New Valley is asking, Connie, the residents of Kahawiki sought out this stability as um, she was just talking about. So how does the state address, and this is kind of a broader question, but how does the state address the service-resistant homeless population? You can't force people to to take housing. Right, and so I think um, that's a whole different story and we probably can do a whole show on that one. <laughs> but I think you know, it's really motivational enhancement. That's the bottom line, you know, are people motivated you know, to seek help and to actually get back into housing? So we spend a lot of time, our outreach team and you know, our case managers, um, the shelter assistants you know, in our, all of our shelters, really spend a lot of time developing the relationships with people, really gauging uh, what the motivation is and how we can further motivate people. I think we need to reconnect people with what they ultimately want in their own lives. And usually that means you know, being in a more stable place, um, being able to predict you know, what life is gonna be like and being healthier. You know, so I think um, when we con can connect people back with their own personal goals, we're able to motivate people to think a little bit differently. But some people cannot, and you know, this person might be asking about some people are chronically homeless, and I really could you know, go on about that, but it really is about helping people get treatment sometimes, and that takes a lot. And, um, and truly, you know, I hope maybe you know, one day we can talk more about that and what it really takes you know, to just get people connected when they themselves don't want it. Mm -hmm. you know, guardianships and um, court-ordered treatment could be answers, you know, but uh, again, that you know, requires a little bit more explanation, I think. We're approaching the end of the hour, but Cambria, I definitely want to ask you, what kind of a difference do you think this is making in your life long term? Without this opportunity, what would you see for you and your son, and, and what do you see instead? Oh gosh, without this opportunity, I don't know where we would be. We might have ended on the, up on the streets, because uh, after, after a certain amount of time, you can no longer stay in the transitional housing, and then honestly, without here, I don't know where we would have gone. Um, and we just had a few months left uh, in the transitional housing, so it was really such a blessing. Um, and now, I mean, anything is possible, really. And I know you said that um, in the situation that you were in before, it wasn't just you, but there were several other families who also got uh, got in at the same time. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, it was huge. I, I don't know if, I know there's a few organizations and, and shelters and whatnot that um, everyone came from, but from the one I was in, there's six, six families. Uh, actually, we're all single moms. There's six of us, and we all... We all got in, six, all six of us got in, so um, well, we already had a, a close bond, and so to now, you know, be succeeding and living as neighbors, it's, it's such a blessing. I mean, Duane, when you hear that, it must be so fulfilling. I mean, that was what this all started out to do. Yeah, it brings <laughs> yeah, tears to my eyes. Um, yeah. Tell us about this. We want to give you the last word tonight. How, how has this project met or exceeded your expectations? Uh, the community support and all of the people who have put their time, energy, and dollars behind um, making this become a reality is it just exceeded all expectations. You know, Hawaii is a really generous place with 
with uh, people with big hearts. And um, I, I, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you all. And if yeah. people do want to donate or to participate, donate services, money, whatever, what have you, uh, how can they get involved? Oh, Connie. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams no. Foundation, AIO yeah. Foundation yeah. is where you want to look. And I think they have a website, too. Yeah, yeah that's the IO Foundation, AIO, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you so thank much you. To, for all of you for being here tonight. Mahalo to you for joining us. We thank our guests, Dwayne Carisu, businessman and project organizer for Kahawa Wiki Village, Connie Mitchell, the Executive Director with the Institute for Human Services, Cambria Vance, who resides in Kawiki Village with her son, and Ryan Kusumoto, President and CEO of Parents and Children Together. Next week on Insights, we begin a special six-week series leading up to our election 2018 candidate forums. Each week, residents from different islands will be here to represent their communities. What are the issues that have the most impact, good and bad, on daily life today and for future generations? generations. Next week's guest panel will be from Kauai, which is also the home island for our moderator, Lari Yamada. This is a unique opportunity for all of us to better understand communities throughout our island state, especially during this election year. I'm Yenji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.